I'll say up front that I'm a little bit limited today. I'm calling in remotely, so I'm on the road and I, I don't have the gallery view on my iPhone, so it's hard to see uh, folks' reactions. Uh, and so I think uh, it would be helpful if people were more verbal as opposed to the thumbs up, I won't be able to see. Noted, uh, noted. But with well, that me, limitation, uh, go ahead, Mercedes. I was gonna say, I'll go ahead and share my screen and then nobody can see anything but what I'm sharing and, my, and whoever's talking. Um, I suppose you can break out the gallery view, but yeah, so um, today, because if you do wanna go ahead and go over the agenda. Sure is we will be reviewing uh, the proposed recommendations that went to the task force on racial equity in juries and clemency and parole. Um, the comments that came back on those recommendations, which as I mentioned in the email, uh, were few and far between and they received overwhelming support. So that's exciting. Um, we're gonna discuss in more detail our fines and fees. I think that's what the bulk of our discussion should be today. Um, and then towards the end, uh, we'll also have some more detail about where we're at with the prison discipline recommendations. Um, so going forward, really quickly, or not quickly, the racial equity. Well, uh, Mercedes, yeah. before we go too far into the uh, agenda, uh, let's get the minutes from last week approved. And uh, I, again, I don't have the gallery view, so I can't see people's expressions. Have folks had an opportunity to review the minutes that were distributed? Uh, are there any comments or questions regarding those minutes? No. Hearing none, is there a motion? Uh, so moved. moved Thank you. Approved. Thank you, Mary. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan. Uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 And the ayes have it, surprisingly. Uh, so the motion passes and then it's approved. Uh, thank you, Mercedes. Uh, I, I think it'd be helpful if you were to go forward with the uh, review of the, of, of the agenda. I'll say one word of welcome. We do have one of our uh, expert guests, uh, expert uh, resources with us, uh, UNC professor Frank uh, Baumgartner. And Frank has been helpful in so many different ways, but has made himself available uh, during this working session uh, to the extent folks have questions, uh, ideas, or thoughts that uh, his input would be helpful. Uh, he's available to us uh, this morning. Uh, Mercedes, please uh, Great. continue. Thank you. So when it came to the racial, um, racial equity and juries, uh, we had to a couple comments that had to do primarily with um, how jurisdictions would obtain uh, naturalized citizens lists. And there are some questions regarding privacy concerns. So what I'd like to do during this time is to go through the comments that were made by a task force members because they weren't, there weren't very many. Have you guys discussed and we can go over these results. So as you'll see here, the first recommendation of fair cross-section guarantee, expanding the jury pool sources um, and encouraging county commissioners to use those sources, that got a 14 yeses out of no, uh, two no's. Uh, Justice Earls made an excellent uh, red line edit about changing other than um, to in addition to, which is exactly what we had meant. Um, and then let's see, the next comment goes to, it's a comment made by Letney, and it, it goes on to state that the talking about the justification says that um, being a part on having a right to an impartial jury um, should be eligible for each citizen regardless of race, right? But while I, it says, while I support a recommendation, he'd like to know how citizenship will be verified. Currently using the voter registration and driver's license list presumes those entities will verify citizenship. I don't know if the jury commissioners will have a process to validate this and if it will be used if other sources of jurors are allowed. And then uh, Sheriff Ingrams made a comment that he cannot support jury selection of any person that is not a citizen of the United States. This is not a right afforded to a US, afforded, this is a right afforded a US citizen. So um, to answer those questions to a certain degree, first I've solicited um, responses from all of these 
questions to Emily Howard to see um, if she had any input on this. Um, regarding where the jury lists would come, excuse me, newly naturalized citizen lists would come from, um, I was able to find that the Superior Court of DC um, has a plan, you'll see a link in that comment, um, and they get their list directly from US Citizenship Immigration Services. There are a handful of jurisdictions that do this. Um, there's a table, uh, the North Carolina Conference on State Courts has a jury study that goes back. Um, it has a table, but it does not give into detail exactly where the naturalized citizen list comes from um, or which jurisdictions use those. I will just mention that this was a recommendation that came from the American Bar Association principles for juries and uh, jury trials back in 2005. Um, it was adopted by the National Center for State Courts. Um, and so that's what I was able to find regarding that question. Um, the other recommendations, reviewing Batson, um, got it, excuse me, this updating jury pool lists more frequently and uh, correcting addresses to reduce undeliverable summons, got her in a rounding 16 out of the 16 people that voted, um, including race data on jury lists to monitor compliance with the fair section cross guarantee, fair cross section guarantee. That got a 15 um, out of one with a comment being um, this would encourage racial profiling. Um, Recommendation 1.4 got 14 yeses and two noes. Um, this is where we got into some discussion about the transparency of the jury list. At what point they were, they become public, um, if they do become public. So um, DA Woodall mentioned, I, he said, I disagree with the requirement jury list, uh, with this requirement that jury list. I assume this means each prospective juror's names be a public record. With today's technology, any person can gain personal information with only a person's name, especially in small and rural communities. This could easily lead to juror harassment, intimidation, or worse. By making the list public, in certain cases, jurors' safety may be compromised. Um, a similar comment went um, to Sheriff Ingram, because they could jeopardize the safety of a person serving as a juror, this could also lead to juror tampering. So I will point out that this recommendation was about making the list that comes from the DMV to the juror commissions. Those lists do include um, the names and the addresses and things of that sort. And it is in the statute, it specifically says that it is not part of the public, it is exempt from public um, records. That being said, um, when you look at the statute that applies to the actual list that's used to pull jurors. So I guess there's the source list, the master list, and then who's actually impaneled, right? Um, the master list, the addresses, if you look at the bottom, the addresses and dates and births are, are confidential and are not subject to disclosure without an order of the court. So I wanna say, I think that there is room to um, put this language in such a way that makes sure that Obviously, any concerns about jury tampering um, and personal identifying information is not made public. Uh, so if there's any, I, those are the two that we had the majority of comments on. If you'd like, I can continue to go through um, the rest of the comments. As you'll see, um, let's see, this one, sorry, lost my place a little bit. The next one was uh, 15 yes, one no. Um, Clemens made a comment that there are those Mercedes, uh, can we go back to the other recommendation and have just a brief discussion about how that recommendation uh, changes current practice? Uh, my own recollection is that I've been able to get uh, master lists uh, quite easily uh, through the clerk's office and on occasion having uh, informal approval by the senior resident judge. Uh, to permit the release. Uh, is, that, is that the process that we're talking about changing so that uh, that list uh, becomes immediately available uh, to the public without either clerk or judicial involvement? I think there would always be clerk involvement because it's a public, it would be a public record request. 
Uh, and so somebody would have to comply with their request and the clerk is the one that I guess possesses the list or the, I mean the jury commission that probably usually operates in the clerk's office. So I would, I would say that there'd always be clerk's involvement, um, but they would have to make that determination whether it was a, a public record or not. And so it, the statute could be clear as to, it could be a little bit more clear as to what becomes public record and when, or what what's not confidential, right? Because what is clear now is, if I, and I can pull up if you'd like, um, I don't have a link for it, but the language in 2043.4 uh, at the very end, C, you know, just makes a makes a statement that um, that those those sourced lists are not are not subject to the public record. And, and you know, and it seems like they could be if there was the provisions that there was no personal like identifying information in them. Because names are already available, right? I mean, it, it, certain names are already available. So if you don't have that personal identifying information, it, it wouldn't necessarily uh, put people at risk. And then you could also include language that says, you know, that would allow a judge, I think in the public records law, there are definitely places where it allows a judge to make a determination to make something public or to not make something public, to, you know, to, uh, if there's cause, right, to, to make it confidential. Mm -hmm. So my goal, my goal for this recommendation, I should have started with that, for the racial juries and uh, race, racial equity in juries, and for the parole, clemency and parole recommendations is for us to see if we can get language that will go to a vote on Friday. So um, I can, we have about two to three more minutes allotted to discuss this, and I'd be happy to go through each of these comments. Um, I've gone through the ones that are, Substantive. There have been um, some statements about um, we need to confer with the conference of DAs, um, and that there, you know, has not been enough kind of information provided. But as I mentioned, there's overwhelming support for the recommendations as as they are written, and so uh, I just need a little bit of guidance on you guys on how we want to proceed. I can continue to go through the comments, or we can wordsmith um, this one recommendation such that it'll go to a place that. We can vote on. Or the task force can work and vote on on Friday. Well, can we survey survey the members to see if there's any uh, questions or or comments and or and or suggestions, Alan? So, I guess my question is: so the names are available now, and Tell me what specifically we're, what the change to that would be. The, just the, the, the their, their race and sex and all of that would be yeah. attached to that. I think it would be helpful if I pulled up the statute, um, 24-3. So if you could bear with me for two seconds, I'm gonna pause <clears throat> my screen share and pull up the statute. Um, bear with me, discuss amongst yourselves. I mean, as long as you're not, divulging the personal information. I mean, what we're after is the basically the racial makeup of the jury and the, and, and the other the other information uh, as a whole, not individually is my, I think that's what we're after, right? I, yes, I think that that is, that's my understanding. And so if you scroll down here, you'll see, um, C, let me scroll up a little bit, that this list so provided shall be used solely for jury selection and election record purposes and no other information provided by the commissioner, the DMV commissioner, the county jury commissions and the state board of elections under this section shall be remain confidential, shall continue to be subject to the disclosure restrictions of 2043.1 and shall not be a public record for purposes of 132. So I think that's the part where we're, um, because these are the source lists that we're asking also to start including race data, um, having transparency in what that source list before it gets dwindled down to a master list, before it gets dwindled down to the impaneled jury, um, is would be able to paint the, the picture of 
if we have a fair cross section. That doesn't seem to me to invade personal privacy. Maybe I'm missing something. Um, I'll let you, the rest of you weigh in on that. So in, as I mentioned, I mean, I think that they have overwhelming support. And so I don't know that we need to spend too much time on these. I think there's backing for them. And I'd be, um, you know, at this point, I'd just ask, do you think that language with this red line change um, in addition to, as opposed to other than, um, is something that we could put forth uh, on Friday. So are we calling for a vote or just a show of consensus? Uh, I think it's just a show of consensus. I don't think we need a formal vote, but if you'd like to have a formal vote, it's, it's up to you. Yeah. It sounds like we don't have any, uh, you know, it sounds like there's no concerns about going forward. If, if anybody has concerns about forward, I ask that you speak now. <laughs> and so I will move on now to the next hey. one. Yes. Can, can I just add one point um, to the extent to which there's no edits that are necessary for the recommendation, given the broad consensus or broad majorities and support. Um, you all can also use your presentation time to provide some education around some of the concerns that people had. So rather than make an edit, just set, you know, yes. speak to the privacy issue as you have here today. And then, you know, that would allow um, to the extent people were concerned, they can they can have that information but there's no change that you all need to make at this, at this point. Excellent, I'll be sure that we're prepared to do that. Um, all right, so I, and then the next one, I will turn to um, our increased funding for Governor's Clemency Office and Parole Commission. Also, renowning support, yes, 14, two, no, two no's. Um, and I'm gonna, we got very few, well, I wouldn't say that, we got some comments, um, the majority of which were that they didn't have enough information on the need for this type of recommendation. So I, I, we have asked, I think Mary is going to be presenting it. And um, if we do decide to present it at the task force on Friday. So going uh, through these comments very quickly, um, Sheriff Ingram, again, saying he doesn't have information documenting the need um, that the office needs to be revamped. Um, Lightning made a comment, COVID impact and related statistics are subject to many factors and there does not seem to be agreement on the scope of the problem. Facilities should certainly do all they can to protect those incarcerated, provide care, et cetera. However, outright release may have negative impact on public safety and public health. So that is just maybe you know, a comment. Um, Lightning also made a comment, um, if the persons are parole eligible, there is already a system and process to consider these factors, uh, which I think is true and we're asking them to continue in that vein with more funding. Um, what all adds to recommendation 1.1 subpart one, which I believe was there, um, made the comment, I don't believe those with life sentences without the possibility of parole should be considered. Also, if a person committed a violent crime against another person, they should not be considered unless they have completed their minimum sentence under the Structured Sentencing Act. So um, that's a comment, right? Um, Worth discussion. The rest of the comments had um, were from Sheriff Ingram that he doesn't have information uh, that the, there's need um, the, that there's need uh, for the for the recommendation. Let me made a, a comment: the parole system should be considering these factors, and that is there. And that's about it. So, Mary, if you'd like to discuss what um, any of these or what you, your thoughts are, anybody else that you'd like to discuss. Well, so Mercedes and I spoke about these earlier in the week, and I think, you know, the, the lack of information comments we can we can address pretty easily with not a lot of time. If we present this on Friday by talking about communications that we've had with the Parole Commission, for example, the um, there was a comment on the um, requirement of implicit bias training for parole staff that said, well, who, you know, why, why is this needed? Well, because a parole commissioner <laughs> suggested that we we include it. Um, what we, I can also talk a little bit about the, um, the Hayden case and Judge Boyle's order that, that laid out all these facts that really show that the Parole Commission is overworked and underfunded. On Judge Woodall's comment, I, I, I understand where he's coming from. I think my response to that is that we're not giving the governor any additional power, right? He could do these things right now if he wanted to. A, a prudent governor isn't going to... <laughs> you know, exercise clemency irresponsibly. We just want to give him 
the resources that he can that he and that office could work together to make reasonable decisions. So I, I don't see him. I don't see any governor. They've always had the power to do it, throw and open the prison doors. We just want them to have the resources to make responsible decisions. And, and right now they're they're not in a position to to do that work. So um, that was pretty much all I had after after reviewing the comments. But um, that's. Uh uh, this is Anita Earls. If I can jump in uh, with a comment about the parole commission recommendation, um, I think it might be very useful, um, and it was it, it would be very useful if we sent some kind of email communication to the entire parole commission saying these are the recommendations we're considering and inviting their input before we take a formal vote, um, just to avoid, um, I think that will smooth the way towards actually implementing the recommendations um, if we if we take that step. Justice Earls, that's on our, our to-do list. It, I, um, I agree, but I, I wonder if that will affect our timing, right? I'm not sure that, because um, today's, today's Tuesday, right? Um, so maybe we should consider presenting later. We were, this is Jasmine, we were going to reach out to them today. Okay, okay. That, that was already on our to-do list. Okay. So okay. we'll I do didn't... our best, yeah. I'm having a hard time reading that, but I, I think the comment that those um, that we would only be considering the individuals that had served their minimum under structured sentencing, that was understood, I think, wasn't it? And so if we want to be explicit about that, I think that might be okay. I'm trying to find that comment. In, in the parole recommendation? Correct. I mean, in the clemency recommendation. Well, I, I'm having a hard time reading it, but I should have it in front of me. But um, I think that was the comment on the parole, parole piece. Isn't that right, Mercedes? Is that where it was? Yes, it was, the comment was about, let's see if I can pull it up. Woodall's, um, they should not be considered unless they have completed their minimum sentence under the Structured Sentencing Act. Is that the comment that you're referring yep. to? Yep. And so is that something that needs to be clarified? Or Mary can clarify that in the in her comments? Well, it wouldn't hurt to put it in there somewhere. Yeah, I, I guess the, you know, the intent of, of asking the parole commission to um asking both the governor and the parole commission to sort of prioritize these folks who have served their minimum under structured sentencing i, I think we can we can add that um i, I didn't I, I didn't want to kind of draft it in a way that seemed like we were actually pulling back on the governor's ability to grant clemency overall if that makes sense right we've identified a category of people we think should be prioritized and uh i, I think i could wordsmith that a little to um, respond to his concern and, and we could send that around before Friday again. I mean, yeah. Do we, do we want to do, do, we definitely want to do that? Because uh, it might, but we could try to wordsmith it right now maybe. Oh. Okay. I know that's hard to do. I I'm, I'm hate group writing, um, but is there some simple language that might clear it up so that we can move away with from this meeting kind of giving it to the parole commission and let me see hold on one second but could you put it up on the screen and maybe make it bigger or i could oh my goodness i never you guys i didn't realize i wasn't sharing okay. my screen anymore i'm looking at it over over here and over here so no, no 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 can you see it better now i didn't realize i wasn't sharing my screen i i was still on pause um did that help it's bigger yes thank you and i'm I, you so know, sorry you guys i i was and then that's the comment. Um, so, and maybe if they had, if they have served their minimum sentence under this, so instead of if they've been served, yes, yeah, okay, served, that's just a couple of words down here. Like, like here, served their minimum. Yeah, yeah, that works. Good. Yeah. All right. That was easy. Thank no, you. No, that was the easiest thing I've done all day. All right. <laughs> all right. So. I think we're in a good spot here. And so if we are, and I don't hear any um, concerns or questions, we might move on to the fines and fees discussion. Great, awesome. Uh, 
Let's see if I can do this. And signs and fees. All right, let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. So this is where we need to start the bulk of our work moving forward. Is that big? I have taken a stab at a problem statement and full disclosure, these are pulled, these are lines pulled directly from all of the reports and the presentations that we were giving. So I try to give footnotes at every place to make sure that we're providing sources. Um, I don't think we should, I don't think we need to go into the details of reading this right now unless you guys want me to. Um, so coming down here, we, as you guys know, had um, an, a survey of you guys regarding fines and fees and you guys have provided your comments. And so what I've done is I've pulled those comments into this document um, and hopefully we can get to a place where we have a consensus on these recommendations such that we can move them forward to a survey and um, for the task force to get input from the task force, similar to what we just did with our previous uh, set of recommendations. So what is very, why I invited Frank here uh, to speak with us today, Professor Bumgarner, um, is because we, if you'll see, we asked for you guys to vote on the larger policy issues and then get into the specifics, right? So on the larger policy issues, you'll see that um, reducing court fines and fees resounding 4.75 out of five, um, eliminating state and municipal reliance on fines and, fee, fines and fees 4.25 out of five. And then this one was a, um, oh, excuse me. It scrolls down, was a 4.75 out of five. So the overall arch, so my takeaway was that our overall arch um, policy issues have overarching, overwhelming support. Um, I want to, before we delve into recommendation one and three, I think the bulk of our discussion with Professor Bumgarner might, it might help if we talk about number two for a little bit. So the recommendation was eliminating state and municipal government reliance on fines and fees. The idea was enacting a statutory cap on those on the municipal revenue that can come from fines. So we had a couple of comments such that oh, if you click here, you will see our comments of that is not the right comment. Sorry, guys. Bear with me. There we go. Having a little trouble. This one. Here we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so Hopkins. Um, and if you guys want to comment on your own without me reading them, by all means, I don't need to be the one talking all the time here. But um, Mike, he had made a comment that this might be a solution looking for a problem, right? Um, Mary made a comment that you're not sure that the statutory cap is an answer, um, that they shouldn't have an incentive to criminalize behavior to bring in revenue, but um, there are other ways to accomplish that goal. Um, Judge Thornburg. Um, so yeah, made the made the suggestion. Uh, while there seems to be consensus around weeding out antiquated local ordinances that have unintended consequences, a statutory cap is a state versus local issue that may require more input and discussion. That's a very good point. And so um, you'll see that the overall recommendation got a 2.75, like the, the 2.1 recommendation. So we are having what I think is an issue with we. All, if we all agree on the overarching policy issue, um, there's not a consensus on how to achieve that policy, which in my opinion is very similar to um, the recommendation that we're making about kind of increasing um, childcare for jurors, right? It's a very overarching policy idea. It requires a lot of funding. Uh, that's the idea. <laughs> and, and it's hard um, It's hard for us to make that as an action item. So. Um, or it requires a change in how funding is provided, right? And so that's kind of where we're at with this. I would welcome Professor Bumgarner's comments. I'd welcome all y'all to discuss to see how we want to proceed with this. Um, uh, thanks, um, Mercedes, and thanks to everybody for inviting me and um, giving me this opportunity to give some thoughts. I'm going to put in the chat uh, a possible uh, principle to consider. But before I do, let me 
just give the shortest little background about some things that I've found in my research. One is um, the, and I sent an email just to two of the staff people um, that includes what I'm going to say, so it can be distributed with the sources. Um, one is the um, the 2015 Department of Justice. Here we go. Uh, investigation of the um, Ferguson Police Department uh, found that they had a pattern and practice of what they called predatory policing. So that was, you know, clearly uh, a big problem, and they relied on the police department and the courts for a substantial portion of their budget. And of course, that had all kinds of adverse consequences to uh, marginalized people in Ferguson, Missouri. And I actually, with several of my students, just published a paper uh, that I give the link to there about fines and fees and racial disparities and traffic stops in North Carolina. And we found several interesting things. They're quite complicated, actually. but. Uh, uh, a municipality that has a higher reliance on fines and fees. And I should say that no municipality relies totally or even largely on fines and fees. The numbers go from 0% of the municipal budget up to a maximum of about 9%. So it's not like uh, these are the majority of any uh, department, uh, municipality's budget, but you know, some rely on it more than others. It also can be used sometimes, and there is anecdotal evidence of city managers telling police department chiefs that they need to raise more money if they want to have a bigger budget the following year. So uh, there is some evidence that policing is correlated with budget shortfalls in the previous year and the need to raise more money. Uh, so anyway, we found that. Uh, we also cited in that article, if you're interested, a number of other academic studies. And I want to point out that the racial disparities are really complicated and not always consistent. In some studies, they found that reliance on fines and fees leads to higher uh, ticketing, and that the police officers doing the ticketing target white drivers on the assumption that they're more likely to be able to pay. So there's a wide variety of different racial disparities that come that can come out of this. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to mention as kind of background is the, the issue of property, property forfeitures and seizures. And there is some evidence, at least occasionally, that departments, police departments and sheriff's departments, you know, retain those properties. And that could be expensive cars, could be homes, yachts other things that are seized, uh, usually in drug-related um, police activities. Uh, and then those agencies get to retain that property and they sell it and use the, pr the proceeds sometimes to send the staff to expensive conventions. And uh, we give an example there where there was a traffic stop of an NBA player and it led to a big investigation of the local sheriff's department, which I think was in Georgia, not North Carolina. Uh, but it showed a pattern and practice of seizing, targeting people with expensive cars, and then seeking to seize those cars and use the proceeds to fund the sheriff's department. So that was uh, quite the scandal. So I think a simple principle is simply to uh, eliminate the financial incentive. And I put it there in one sentence, no agency, no government agency should retain for its own use any funds received through costs imposed on individuals through the criminal justice system. It's a very simple principle. And it would require a lot of readjustment of various um, current practices, but I think it would certainly work towards um, making the public understand that the reason for police activity is unrelated to the desire to raise funds. And I think that would be a principle that uh, would be very useful. So those are my comments, and I'd be glad to talk any of it through with you. Well, just anecdotally, I can share that, uh, especially five years ago, I don't, I don't know what the current situation is. The, the federal Western District of North Carolina was the 
the highest grossing district in the country when it came to private forfeitures. And, uh, and uh, there was a clamor back then uh, that this was an example of predatory policing. Uh, and uh, at, the, at that point, I thought the numbers were really clear that this was an, in, an important incentive uh, to certain uh, traffic and uh, traffic stops, highway stops, and those sorts of things. Uh, profiles were, were designed specifically to intercept folks with high value cars and, and other properties that were seizure, seizurable. So it certainly seems like uh, this would be a place where we would want um, uh, a, the sort of aspirational language, Frank, that you're suggesting. Uh, the modification that you're some suggesting. It seems like we don't want uh, the message to go out that um, this kind of pre predatory policing should be encouraged, endorsed, or even permitted. Well, thanks, Henderson. And that, that just suggests that the anecdote that I provided there about the NBA player, Mike Scott, is not just a one-off example. No. The other thing I wanted to mention is I, I, I in reviewing you know, your your work so far, a lot of it has to do with court related fees. And I just wanted to point out that the issue extends beyond only court fees and prison and jail fees, but it goes to speeding tickets and other kinds of more routine um, everyday behavior that even outside of the courts, but in the policing system. That was just a just a suggestion or just to point that out for you. I don't know if they do it in North Carolina, but I know in some other states, local municipalities have um, sort of traffic safety classes that one can enter and pay for. And they their ticket will be dismissed if they show, if they prove they've completed that successfully. And that money goes to the local, uh, it stays, stays locally. And I don't, are you aware of that? I mean, I don't know how that plays into it. Otherwise, they might stay in the system. I think there's a lot of uh, questions that would have to be resolved, you know, uh, with people that are more familiar about local finance. But um, uh, you could think about fees that are no net profit, but still there's a fee for some service. But, you know, I worry about that because the jail fees, $10 a day for being in prison, you know, certainly the prison system is not um, producing a profit on such fees, but <laughs> still imposing the fee on the individual through the criminal justice system. So, um, you know, I leave that to you as members of the commission, but it's certainly an important issue. Yeah, and this is Mike, if I could jump in, because I do have some knowledge of local, I'm chairman of the board of commissioners in Transylvania County. And, and I can tell you that, that I have never, I've been, I've been chair for, for eight years now and been a commissioner for 12 years. And at least, at least in my little corner of the world, I have never seen, if, if we're saying that what we're wanting to, the problem that we're wanting to fix is this kind of predatory uh, uh, traffic stops and, and, and uh, fine kinds of, of, of uh, transactions with the public simply to generate revenue for a department that that does not happen. I, I I've never experienced that as 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 at least in our little corner of the world. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but but what 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 concerns me about this? We're talking about anecdotal references or references from out of not out not in North Carolina. And if if we're gonna, it would be easier to make this case if we had hard examples that we could point to. And, and, and I don't see that we've got that. Now I do, the, the jail fee, yeah, I, I, that's, that's outrageous that we charge people to put them in jail. Um, but but this, this notion that, that, that people, at least in Transylvania County, uh, we, don't, we don't run traffic stops to generate ticket revenue to, to help subsidize the sheriff's department. Well, and, I don't, know, I don't know of a professional county manager or city manager who would ever 
uh, uh, send that message to his his or her chief of police or, or sheriff to, to do that? Well, I could tell you um, that in the article that I included there in the in the document, uh, we looked at every police department in North Carolina over about 15 years. And uh, we did find a statistically important connection between the policing behaviors and traffic stops and uh, two elements of the budget. One was whether the budget had gone up or down in the previous year. And so if there was greater fiscal stress and the, the budget revenues were on the decline, there was an increase in traffic behavior um, targeted on stopping more white drivers, but searching proportionately more black drivers. And then similarly, we found uh, important effects for the percent of the municipal budget that comes from fines and fees. And so those weren't anecdotes, those were pretty big statistical study and it was limited to North Carolina. So I'm, I'm glad for Transylvania County. <laughs> and I'm sure that there's many counties where this is not happening, but it's kind of like, you know, criminal justice in general, where we make certain things illegal, not because we think most people are doing them, but because we want to stop the few uh, lawbreakers or, you know, bad, the bad behaviors is what we're trying to stop, not the good behaviors. And, and we're saying, you know, I agree with you. We're, we're kind of saying the same thing. What I'm saying is let's, let's, let's not talk about anecdotal references. Let's, let's say here's, here's data that shows in North Carolina that this is happening and it's happening in a, in a significant fashion and it's a problem that needs to be fixed. And what set, I think what sets North Carolina unique in when it comes to municipal fees and fines is that North Carolina, unlike many other states, does not have municipal courts that are funded solely through, we have our kind of county state courts where other, other states do have setups where the municipality has, it has its own court and it's funded through its own um, its own fines and fees, which is very problematic. North Carolina is kind of is on the forefront of that, not having that set up where all of our fines and fees go directly into the general state fund and then is distributed out to counties, um, which is the advisable way of, of doing things. I think the question is, is how much are they relying on it and how much is that is that association? Do you see fees going up um, in in conjunction with with uh, stops and things of that sort. So I'd be, um, what I think that we can do is kind of moving forward is if you all are open to it, maybe kind of scrap this, uh, enact a statutory cap as a recommendation, maybe making our recommendation being something along the lines of um, what Professor Rumgardner suggested, no government agency should retain for its own use any funds received through the cost increase. Um, on individuals through the criminal justice system and make this one of our kind of overarching policy um, ideas. That being said, I want to, we're getting close on time that we need to move over to prison discipline, but I do want to talk about these other ideas, um, the comments that everybody made, and if you guys think that we're in a position to move it forward to um, comments and, and the survey for the full task force. So kind of going to, um, the reducing these fees comments can be a little bit tricky. So, Ms. Hawkins, you, you had made a, a comment about how you know, the devil is in details, as always. And so, it's there's certain fees like the $10 jail fee, the two, 250 community service fee, installment fee um, that should be re reduced or, or eliminated, but others are appropriate. And you think that the general court fee of $150 is, is appropriate. So that was kind of a general overarching. If we go into the comments, um, there is more here. So um, this one, reduce or repeal the installment fee, got a five out of five. Um, so I think that that is good to go. There weren't any comments there. Um, Mary had asked a qu question on the jail fee of, um, does the money currently go to counties for jails? And I do believe that it does. Um, we can look at the disbursement um, file that we have and it shows them, but Mr. Hawkins is shaking his head, it's nodding his head yes. So I'm, I'm thinking that that does go um, directly to the counties, um, but also that it's not actually um, 
a very significant part of the budget because they often go unpaid, right? And so there's that to take into consideration. Um, but that got a 4.75 out of five. Um, the next one got, this one interesting enough, got the uh, 2.25 out of five. This is the re repealing or reducing the community service fee and amending the statutory language to expressly state um, that the $250 can be waived. So we had um, Judge Clark you know, made the comment of, uh, you don't actually think that we need to repeal the fee, just give the authority to uh, remit it or waive it or not impose it. Um, and then an express authorization would allow um, for more practical judgments. Uh, Mary, you made the, the same comment that people who can afford this should have to pay it. Um, Judge Thornburg made the comment, um, as with the monitor fee, the state may incur outside costs that may be appropriate to recoup. So um, needing to know more information about the cost of the state for community service. So this one did get um, significant comments. I, I would open it up to you guys right now to talk about how you want to, uh, how you want to present it to the task force. Do we think that repealing or reducing it is, has not gained a consensus because it doesn't seem like it has? and just give a recommendation of um, expressly stating that it can be waived in the statute. Um, or I'm getting a, a nod of sh shake from Clark. Yes, Clark agrees with that. Um, and so does Mr. Ha uh, Mike Hawkins. I don't know, Judge, uh, Judge Stormberg or uh, Mary Henderson. With the waiver, are we suggesting the inquiry as to ability to pay? That the waiver yeah, that recommendation has already been that was one of the first recommendations that we made, right? right? So, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, our thumbs up from Henderson and Mary, you had made a comment that you didn't think it, yeah, people should have to pay it. So, I mean, I just you know, I, I'd like to encourage, I mean, the policy ought to be that if you can't afford it, you shouldn't have to pay it, right? So, however, we can make that happen, but I just know too many, <laughs> too many people who should have been paying that $250 to clean up their messes yeah. that you know um no i appreciate that that's perfect so i, I will um and i should say in mecklenburg county we just went through uh, a really strong community outrage over the fact that the fee was preventing people from completing community service and or uh, a successful uh, diversion uh, and so it does come down uh, to the fact that many middle class and upper middle class folks who uh, get into the system uh, take advantage of the community uh, service uh, program, and they do have the capacity to pay. And the sense is they should contribute uh, towards those costs. Uh, but there should be a very clear uh, inquiry regarding ability to pay. And I think as long as that's there, uh, I can be enthusiastic in supporting it. Excellent. Okay. And so the next one is... Um, lab fees should be assessed for what is actually incurred not the flat fee and that comment got a five out of five now um, limit courts from or ordering individuals on probation to pay supervision fees and other uh, professional fees this one did get some more comments so let's talk about this one so uh, judge clark made a comment i hope our judges are exercising appropriate discussion but many cases warrant these fees Others don't. Um, getting technical, maybe you perhaps limit fees when probation is extended for the sole purpose of complying with monetary obligations. Um, that's maybe a better recommendation. I want, that's um, an excellent suggestion. Um, Hawkins made a comment. When I, when I think limit, I think about the caps on total money that of the fees, as well as considering mitigating factors relevant to a particular case. So that's a, a fair comment as well. And then, um, Pollard made the comment, like community service fee, this is something that theoretically people should pay if they have the means. Um, you've known a handful of people that, um, but you've known a mere handful of people on probation or parole who actually have the money in reality. So I think that is, I, my gut is appreciating very much what um, Judge Clark is saying in that, um, and, and all the comments really, frankly. And so I think that there's a way to maybe wordsmith this a little bit or add some language. Um, I do think it's got, it, it seems to have gotten enough support in order to proceed. Um, trying to see the numbers. 
and I didn't put it in there, so I can pull it up. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody was on board with the idea of it, but just kind of the the language. Of it. And this is one also that we can work um, wordsmith a little bit now before we put out to the whole task force for um, for input, right? Or are we um, put it out as it is and then wordsmith it later once we get the input, whatever you guys are up for. Anybody? I can't, I can't see the language uh, on my it's, iPhone. I would it's support a uh, editing or wordsmithing it offline. Okay. Um, and maybe, so maybe, uh, would you guys be okay with Judge Clark and I doing that before we send it to the task force? Um, great. Yes. With the idea of incorporating her comment about limiting it to, um, limiting courts from ordering people to be on probation and parole when the sole reason that they are on probation and parole is because of payment of fees and fines and fees. That makes sense. Um, okay. So, Let's see here. Yeah. The next one we have is the recommendation three that talks about developing a process to eliminate criminal justice debt. Um, you'll see a lot of these um, got good ratings, right? Um, the 4.5 for um, wait, eliminating the requirement to have a judge's name. You made it, um, Judge. Mr. Hawkins made the comment about how um, you know, he understands the reasoning, but you know judges are elected officials and transparency is important. So you're kind of ambivalent on the island, but you do wonder in addition to the aggregate data by judicial jurisdiction, um, do judges who differ from the aggregate, like are they noted? Um, like maybe a, a, a threshold as opposed to the actual number. Um, and if I could jump in, that was more just kind of brainstorming there. Okay. 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 Uh, so that you know that is is for what it for its worth. Um, we have this clarifying that um, clarifying that the statute that notice is being satisfied by the AOC's monthly notice, and that got a 4.75 out of five. Requiring judges to use a standardized form, also 4.75 out of five. Um, I'm just trying to see if we have any comments here. Um, I, I, Uniform process to strike failure to appears got five out of five. Um, appointing more court appointed attorneys got a four out of five. And then here we got a comment. Um, lawyers can only do so much and they cost money. So that should be allocated elsewhere. Um, this is from uh, Mary Pollard. The actual fix here is to reclassify all class three misdemeanors as infractions and to eliminate local entities ability to create class three misdemeanors. Uh, do we really need to criminalize and create collateral consequences for uh, behavior that is punished by the $50 fine. No, we do not. And that is an idea that I have um, crossed over to working. And the, one of the other working groups is talking about overcriminalization. Amisha is online. And so um, Amisha Cooper is working on that overcriminalization um, kind of working group and that's looking on that issue. And I think that's a good, it's a good point. And um, I don't, I want to, I'm curious to know if we, if we all want to proceed with this. I, I do think having more of a, a court appointed attorneys would help in the matter. Um, but to your point, Mary, that, that is being addressed by, uh, the over is being addressed by another working group right now. Um, so without any comments on that, keep on, on going. Uh, you know, this goes to similar to the language of encouraging Mercedes, are you going to take that out? Is that? I is can, that the, or do you want me? I, I didn't know you 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 went on. I didn't know if the if you were proposing that that come out since the other working group. Well, so um, that's the the other working group is only working on it um, as to Mary's comment, right? So they're they're looking at decriminalizing if decriminalization. So I think our recommendation is still if there are class three misdemeanors that those folks have a, a court appointed attorneys because um, fines and fees are being imposed. And when they don't meet the fines and fees, there's the risk of, of being incarcerated. Um, so, 
this is Jasmine, just a, um, a little bit of context. They are considering that issue. They have also had some discussion about the attorney issue. And so if, if the working group were so inclined for efficiency, we certainly could ask working group three to consider whether or not there could be a combination of sort of if, if this, if not this, then this type recommendation, if this is, is something that people are interested in, in seeing as part of the recommendation. Okay. I think that makes sense, Jasmine. Um, and just, you know, based, uh, because of my day job, I would like any recommendation that provides more quote court appointed attorneys to um, go along with a recommendation that we provide more money for court appointed attorneys and that we pay them a decent um, wage. So that's duly noted. So I'm going to move that out and, and I will um, allow the other working group to work on that. Um, all right, and so we were talking about district attorneys utilizing amnesty and other mass relief efforts. Um, you know, and, and Mike makes a good point, you know, using the term encouraging elected officials to do things is, is kind of um, can be lim have limited use is a good way of putting that. And uh, so it's a good point. And I, and, you know, I think that there is a lot of room for DAs to do things, but um, recommendations in that arena, we can make the recommendation. It's not, it doesn't have a lot of teeth, if you will. Um, so going here to um, stopping issuing arrest I, I, I'm sorry, Mercedes, where does that comment leave the recommendation? I think we're gonna make, I, it's, it, everybody okay. supported it. So I don't okay. see why we wouldn't make it. It's just a matter Very of good. effectivity. Um, yeah, the only ones that I've taken out so far have been the um, I've re replaced um, Frank's language under as the action item, if you will, under recommendation two, and I've taken out the court appointed attorneys that will be going to a different working group. Um, so here we go, stopping issuing arrest warrants for criminal contempt charges, got a 4.7475 out of five. Um, with the comment by Judge Clark, I'd like to think of ways to preclude an arrest warrant even for contempt for failing to appear on the show cause when a defendant has maxed out the sentence. Served on active sentence, cost imposed. Um, again, it's technical, but it happens too many times and that you see that uh, recommendation 3.8 now. So I will say that um, maybe Judge Clark, we can, if, if you want, we can wordsmith this a little bit more. It seems like it's gotten um, a lot of support. So before we put it out to the well, task force, maybe we can wordsmith it a little bit to clarify what you mean on that. Um, last, this was, this came, um, also got 4.5 out of 5, clarifying the language to preclude imprisonment. So that goes to what Judge Clark was talking about for anybody that um, is getting an active sentence when the underlying sentence has been imposed. All right. And Increasing access to licensed restoration clinics, got a five out of five. Stopping the suspended of stopping suspending licenses because of failure to appear, failure to comply, um, 4.5 out of five. I also plugged in um, some language that I got from Jennifer Simmons about Senate Bill 494, um, which would automatically restore licenses that have been suspended for more than a year um, for failure to pay after a year, right? So it would automatically restore those licenses after a year. That is something that came, um, so I'd like to get input from you. Would you guys want me to um, in, in, include that in the recommendation as an example language and kind of beef up that recommendation before we take it to the task force? It seems like it makes sense. And then the last one here, administrative license revocation got the 4.5 out of five or 4.25 out of 5. And um, Judge Clark made, you need to think about the recommendation. She's not sure if people need to go to jail, especially for class three offenses, right? So um, I think with some tweaking of the language between Judge Clark and I, we can get this out to the task force for survey and vote. But I wanted to get, um, I want y'all to see what we're working with and, and let us know. Also, we need to work on um, getting a little bit of, I guess, if you guys wanted to take a look at the problem statement and we need to draft kind of a, a value-oriented 
future state of what we want this to look at like. Um, those are things that I, I guess I, I want to know, would you guys want an opportunity to redline those before we get those to the task force for input and survey? Or um, yes, I'm seeing a nod yes. So I will make sure that we do that. And um, hopefully if you guys can keep your eye on your email by the end, by before the end of the week, I, this should be in a draft. Well, and at any point, really, frankly, you can come in here and start making edits um, or adding things. Because if you can see, I haven't gotten to the value-oriented feature state yet. Um, and uh, let me know how I can help on that. So on that, without any more discussion, we have 50 more minutes. And I really want to talk about, and I've got Malia here as well, who has done some great work. And I know that Susie is listening in. So um, Susan and Luke, thank you so much for your presentations on prison discipline. So prison discipline, we saw and heard a lot and uh, Malia has done an excellent job of um, pulling together some of the recommendations that we've heard um, into the format that we've been kind of reviewing them, right? My goal at the end of this meeting today with respect to prison discipline is to put these in a survey format to you to get your input. Um, Again, kind of like we've been doing through our process. So, Malia, please feel free to jump in at any point. Um, I'm going to kind of run through these very briefly because we only have about 10 minutes. Um, so, that first recommendation is going to be to reform solitary confinement slash restrictive housing. Um, 1.1 out of that is establishing a committee of experts related to the issue. The second one is implementing alternative plans to restrictive housing and solitary confinement. I should start by saying the majority, if not all of these came from um, Ms. Pollitt's recommendation. Those are the ones that uh, we didn't get a chance to review at the end of our presentation. Um, so providing offenders a plan to step down from restrictive housing, um, allowing a 30 day review, multidisciplinary team review uh, prior to step down, and definitely making sure that um, offenders are stepped down 90 days prior to discharge so that they are not being released directly from restricted housing. Um, the third recommendation being ending or limiting the use of solitary confinement um, and restrictive housing in North Carolina prisons. Um, uh, enacting the Mandela rules, enacting hard limits on the number of days and years a person can spend, ending solitary confinement for people under 21, expanding mental health treatment and using therapeutic diversion units as alternatives to restrictive housing, um, enacting a total ban on placing people with diagnoses of serious mental illness in solitary confinement, uh, and then increasing funding for mental health services in prison. That's kind of a subpart to that. Um, removing dangerousness as an acceptable justification for placing someone in solitary confinement that goes to the kind of arbitrary nature of, um, of control, housing for control, um, and then cr creating incentives for good behaviors with rewards um, as opposed to kind of a more punitive system. Uh, the fourth recommendation under this would be to adopt the VERA recommendations, which goes into reducing the number of infractions that can lead to restrictive housing, um, increasing due process protections, um, re reducing the maximum sentence of time that can be spent in restrictive housing, and adopting and maintaining programs that allow um, diversion and alternative punishment. So this is kind of um, fold into some of the other recommendations that we made, we might be able to consolidate some of them. Um, so that's where we're at. Those primarily came from the presentation that we saw last week. Um, with respect to prison personnel, we, other than kind of you know, increased funding for prison personnel, we were able to come up with a recommendation of increasing um, and requiring crisis intervention training, um, which we believe is already being provided or was provided in the past, but we're not sure, um, according to the presentation last week, if that's continuing. Um, especially especially special training in um, the step for the staff that's in restrictive housing plots that requires kind of a certification to be in that role. And last, we have um, protection for our pre uh, pregnant individuals in prison. And this would be, while we understand that there is a BPS policy that prevents the shackling of uh, women in state um, while they're in custody, while they're in um, labor, there have been reports otherwise. So it would be enacting this as a statute as opposed to um, a, just a DPS policy. 
Um, and then there's other things that kind of go into um, in line with that, which includes um, increasing support for mothers who are released from prison and abolishing the felon exclusion um, for the, the federal SNAP benefits, which is something that we were talking about as a collateral consequence. There might be room to meld those together. Um, and then removing barriers of employment for felons, which is also there's some room um, to meld these with some um, recommendations that are having to do with collateral consequences. Similar to the, you know, our driver driving license suspension recommendation that falls under fines and fees, it is technically a collateral consequence. And so uh, a lot of these kind of meld in that way. Um, so I would think, you know, we might be able to address the employment and the felon exclusion, uh, maybe more under collateral consequences if we get there. Oh, we can do it now. But that is what we're talking about. We have about eight minutes left. So I would, I've been talking a lot. I'd love to hear your input on prison discipline what your thoughts are, where you want to go with it, if you want to hear more. Uh, Malia, if you want to add anything. Mercedes, I'd like uh, primarily to repeat your thanks to Susie and Luke and disability rights. I mean, I think that the recommendations that were offered in the presentation uh, and mostly I thought that we got to, but even the one that we did not get to was extremely helpful. And I think makes for makes our lift a lot lighter. Um, I I would endorse uh, adopting those those recommendations. Certainly after receiving comments from the members. But uh, thank you, Susie. Thank you, North Carolina Disability Rights, uh, for this extremely helpful uh, presentation. I'm just gonna take the opportunity right now to say. Uh, I told you so, Susie. She's listening and she was like, oh, I don't know if that was helpful. And I was like, I promise it was very helpful. Uh, <laughs> I would just say, um, similar to what Justice Earls mentioned um, previously about sharing the other piece with those that are tasked with implementing. I, I don't know if there's a way to, to share these recommendations with um, representatives of the uh, correction system and, and those I, officers to that, that that's number one and then number two I think we had mentioned perhaps having something with regard to um, appropriate funding for those positions and you know re reasonable compensation I, I know there's a piece in there about training but that, that, yeah. I think ours if our I think our our folks in corrections have just gone down and down and down the list of 50 states in terms of funding in relationship to other other states. Gotta be part of the problem. No, I, I think you're, it was not in there and I just added it and I think it was just a, it was, we were assuming it was, it, um, perfect, I added it. I, I agree with what Judge Thornburg said about maybe um, bringing in some people um, who are working or have worked in corrections. Um, I know when uh, when David Geis was at DPS, he, he did some work with um, a coalition on working toward implementing some of these reforms. And I don't know if he's available to sort of vet this. Um, there's a, um, um, Art Beeler is at DPS now. He's somebody who's also on the IDS commission has been following the work of this task force very closely. Um, he might opine on this. I, I think, I, I won't speak for him, but I think, he, um, We've discussed maybe the need or necessity for implicit bias bias training as part of um, correctional officer training. So that might be something we we look at incorporating here in some respect. This is my uh, David Geis. His name has been mentioned a couple of times. He's a county commissioner. I'm having lunch with David Geis today, and, and he's he's uh, I've, I've been sharing this stuff with him, and I'll share this with him too. So. I need you guys to just read over this entire memo while you're at lunch. <laughs> Mike, he, he needs something else on his plate, doesn't he? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and this is Jasmine. DPS is on our list of reach outs, so that will happen. But if there are obviously others, you know, throughout the chain that to be discussed, that sounds great as well. So do I have any um, opposition to sending this out to the full task force for input and questions? 
hearing none, I'm going to do it. All right. All right. Um, thank you so much, Malia, for pulling these together. I really appreciate it. Um, and thank you again for um, you know, condensing the information that we've gotten from, from our um, presenters. So that is everything that I have. I will, uh, we talked about which is a lot. I feel like we did a lot today. Um, the next steps are, um, we're going to, I'm going to meet offline with Judge Clark. We're going to do a little bit of final um, touches to the fines and fees. But other than that, the, uh, the jury and clemency parole proposed recommendations will be going to the task force this Friday for a full vote. Um, I will be submitting to you guys a survey, uh, excuse me, to the task force, a survey on fines and fees um, with the tweaks that Judge Clark and I come up with. And then for the working group, there is going to be a, a survey on prison discipline recommendations uh, for your input and your comments. And that is all I've got. At any point, you want to go into the fines and fees document and redline or make edits, feel free. Thanks, Mercedes. This was a great, great meeting. Thank you. Okay, no problem. We were, we've got three minutes left, so yeah. we can, <laughs> just kidding, I'll, just, I'll let you guys go. Um, but if, yeah. Thank you guys. All right. Uh, if Ken Henderson wants to say anything before we go, there's a question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mercedes, uh, thank you, and thank you to the working group. Uh, I think let's take advantage of the few minutes that we've got uh, and get back to work, uh, working life. I actually just got summoned in, so I need to, I, I'm actually a couple of minutes late. Okay, uh, but this has been very productive. Great meeting, Mercedes. Really appreciate your extension. Uh, thank you, Frank, Susie, and Luke. Uh, the support has been wonderful. And uh, look forward to the meeting on Friday. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye-bye.